Four months before his death, as he was working on what would be his final movie called The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, Heath Ledger was chronically under the weather and exhausted, and his famously handsome face was marred by bags under his eyes. But those closest to him, his roommate, his family back home in Australia, and maybe, though it's not known for sure, his former fiancée Michelle Williams knew the ailing star was struggling with something much worse than a physical illness, but a crippling addiction to prescription drugs. And so, when on January 22, 2008, Heath Ledger, just 28 years old and at the absolute pinnacle of his career, was found dead on the floor of his Manhattan apartment, many of the people who knew him best thought it a horrific, yet perhaps somewhat predictable, end to a life lived in the grip of addiction. Ledger's death was, in so many ways, a familiar Hollywood tragedy. Young, enormously talented and handsome, he shot to superstardom in what seemed like an instant, indulged in all of the excesses of fame, and then came crashing down in the most heartbreaking of ways. Yet, unbeknownst to anyone at the time, Ledger's death was far more complex and possibly more sinister than it appeared, involving a criminal investigation into another hugely famous Hollywood star who many believe may have been responsible for his death. I'm Jason Beckerman. I'm Derek Kaufman. And this is Last Days, Heath Ledger. So the New York State authorities launched an investigation in the wake of his death to learn just how and why he died. That investigation yielded three primary findings. First, Ledger was taking huge quantities of sleeping pills and anti-anxiety medications for at least a few months before he dies. Now, even in large quantities, the sleep and anti-anxiety drugs almost certainly would not have killed him. But the second thing that the coroner found was that um, recently... Heath Ledger had begun taking oxycodone and hydrocodone. These are two hardcore, highly addictive painkillers. They're narcotics. Um, The medical examiner explained that the sleep and anxiety medications, like those taken by Ledger, are designed to depress the central nervous system, but the pain medications on top of it have a similar effect on the body, though they act much more swiftly and much more dramatically. So when you combine these medications, he effectively slowed down his brain function to such a degree that it was no longer even capable of instructing his body organs, specifically your heart and your lungs, to continue their life-supporting functions. And third, the investigators found, and this is most critical to the story, was that Ledger was not prescribed the oxycodone or the hydrocodone by a doctor. Instead, he got them from some other source, and that would be the focus of the oncoming investigation. Before we get there, let, let's just talk a little bit about how Heath Ledger became who he became. He's born in Australia, I think pretty well known. Yep. Did a bunch of uh, low-level TV shows and movies there. And then in 1998, knowing that he had some potential for fame, he moved out to Los Angeles to try and strike, it fa- try and strike fame and wealth. The next year, he landed a starring role opposite Julia Stiles in 10 Things I Hate About You. This is a huge role. Huge role. For people of my generation, there were a lot of Shakespeare adaptations at the yes. time. This is a, a teen comedy based on Taming of the Shrew. He steals the show. He is a breakout star yeah. in this movie. Mel Gibson then casts him at his, as his son in a movie called The Patriot in 2000. Not a great movie. No, but coming off of Braveheart, it had huge expectations at the box office. And he's a lot of just saw a it. kid, and yeah. he's now got co-leading roles with somebody like Mel Gibson. Follows up next year with A Knight's Tale, sort of a, a, a farcical, satirical look at medieval times. He had it all. He was sort of this dreamboat, but he also had comedic timing. He was he really on the precipice of greatness. So later that year, he has a standout performance in Monster's Ball, and he builds upon that. And in 2005, he gets cast in the groundbreaking role of Ennis Del Mar in Brokeback Mountain as the simple cowboy who finds happiness in a relationship with another man. I wish I knew how to quit you. Then why don't you? Why don't you just let me be, huh? Because of you, Jack, that I'm like this. I'm nothing. I'm, I'm, just, I'm nowhere. Oh. Get the fuck off me! <laughs> The role earned Ledger his first Oscar nom, first of two Oscar noms, uh, and catapulted him really into A-list territory here from everybody sort of said he's got acting chops and he's certainly pretty, 
but now this guy can really do it. Yeah, he's on the screen with Jake Gyllenhaal, Michelle Williams, who he meets, Alan yeah. Brokeback Mountain, who ends up becoming his fiance. It's an incredible movie. A lot of people remember it as this being the movie that should have won the Best Picture Oscar. And obviously the biggest thing that comes out of that, not just the Oscar nom and the, and the hugely important movie, socially important movie, is for Ledger, it gets him the role as the Joker in the Dark Knight sequel in 2008. And this is really the role for which he is most famous. Do I really look like a guy with a plan? You know what I am? I'm a dog chasing cars. I wouldn't know what to do with one if I caught it. You know, I just do things. I remember at the time, too, I just want to pause on this role. It was a huge risk because, remember, the Joker in Batman movies was Jack Nicholson before right. him. So you're stepping into the shoes of the one of the most iconic film actors of all the time. And the way Jack played it was very broad with a big grin, yeah. sort of a jokier approach. This was a very grounded movie. Remember, he's a pretty boy at this point. And he's a pretty boy. Right. And he's going yes. for the most raw, realistic version of a psychopath that we had really seen in a comic book movie. And he nailed it. Right. And now people remember him as a Joker, I think maybe even more than Jack. In any event, his career is now just taking off. Um, but he's sort of personally adrift. So in mid-2007, his relationship uh, of three years with longtime girlfriend Michelle Williams starts to fall apart. Remember, they had met on the set of Brokeback Mountain back in 2004. They actually had a daughter, Matilda, in 2005. You know, the couple lived together in Brooklyn. They were sort of a, you know, sort of hip couple, I would yeah. say. They were young Hollywood, but they lived in Brooklyn. So right. they were removed from Certainly had from all the, the money LAC. to live in Manhattan, but chose to live across the bridge in Brooklyn. Yes. And that was kind of... You're right. They were they were considered the hip couple. Yeah, they were cultivating a sort of cool vibe. Yeah. Um, so they lived there. There were, you know, pap photos of them because of their level of fame. But they were trying to have a sort of quieter existence in, in Brooklyn. By all accounts, he was a very loving and doting father to Matilda. Um, with Williams, it was slightly different. Uh, you know, he like to party a little bit. I mean, yeah. this is well known about Heath Ledger now that he's passed. At the time, I don't think it was as well known, but you know, he he liked the nightlife as well as being a doting father and he sort of tried to ride both of these lifestyles. So, they end up splitting in September of 2007. They never really publicly confirmed the reasons. There were speculation that there was some infidelity involved with with Heath, uh, but that was really never confirmed at the time because like I said, they like to live a little bit outside of the limelight of right. Hollywood. The breakup, nevertheless, it was known, took a huge toll on Ledger because his life really starts to unravel here. And it was around this time that he begins this descent into depression and anxiety. One of his close friends is a person named Jerry Grinnell, started staying with Heath near the time of his death. And he described a man who was just torn apart by anxiety, depression, resulting from that demise of his relationship with Williams, which really seemed to hold his life together, give him that purpose. Grinnell said he missed Michelle and he missed his little girl. He desperately wanted to see Matilda and hold her and play with her. He was desperately unhappy, desperately sad. Grinnell ended up talking about Ledger's inability to sleep as sort of a symptom of all that was going on in his personal life and described a guy who would walk the floors deep into the night. He would take huge quantities of Ambien, which is a quite potent sleep medication, um, and sometimes multiple pills per night. But it wasn't just the split with Williams that was really bringing him down. Throughout 2007, he had been filming The Dark Knight, and he really talked openly to The New York Times. He had, there was a big interview in The New York Times uh, in, in 2007, late 2007, just a couple of months before his death. Um, where he talked openly about the physical and mental uh, toll that this portrayal was of the Joker was having on him. He said, quote, last week I probably slept an average of two hours a night. I couldn't stop thinking. My body's exhausted and my mind is still going. He admitted to the New York Times that he would take an Ambien to sleep. If it didn't work, is what we talked about a minute ago. He would take another, fall asleep, wake up, wake up a couple hours later, his mind still racing. He said that really what caused it was that he was playing a, quote, psychopathic, mass-murdering, schizophrenic clown with zero empathy. He would stay up night after night and, quote, locked himself away, formed a little diary, and experimented with voices. This makes a lot of sense in hindsight. If you watch The Dark Knight, he's so close to that performance. He's yeah. bedraggled. His hair is always sort of wet and stringy. He's clearly deranged. And to give that performance, you have to sort of embody that persona. It sounds like he really did in a sort of very direct method way. Yeah. And it had a real impact on his personal it life. It really did. But these, you know, these struggles, Derek, were completely unknown to the public. As far as anybody known, he was, at this point, he's single. He's living in Manhattan now. He's moved out of the Brooklyn home. He and, he and Williams have split. 
and he's living in Manhattan. And by all appearances, he's just living sort of a happy-go-lucky life of a, of a rich and famous uh, star. Uh, begins partying hard. He's seen out with really famous, beautiful models. He was dating models, sort of, you know, going through the models, sort of doing the DiCaprio thing. He's in his late 20s. I mean, he is at the prime of life to do this. Yeah, and he's also sort of befriending all these Hollywood celebs. So he is doing the circuit, you know, back in the late 2000s. He is doing the celebrity thing in New York to the fullest. And everybody thinks he's fine, but clearly he's not. Yeah, if you read the New York Times piece with the benefit of hindsight that we have now, you can really see what is just a deeply troubled young man. He's coming undone in real time. Yeah, it's sort really, of happening before our you eyes. See, you read this story, and it's, again, as you said, in the, with the benefit of hindsight, it's really haunting to read it. I mean, you, we're, we'll talk about a couple of things that are specifically mentioned in the Times article. Just think about this in the context, uh, you know, now that we know what he was going through, to hear these stories is, is really painful. And you got to think about it. He's a man, he's 28 years old when he passes. He's got a dizzying amount of fame. He's beautiful to look at. Yeah. He's a great actor. He's on he's the top of his game. He's single again. Yeah, you can the party whole your face yeah. off. And, and these are some of the consequences. So the report describes Ledger's house. And I often think that your house is a reflection of sometimes your persona or your inner turmoil. Whatever's going on in your life, if you're neat and tidy and your house looks neat and tidy, then your life is in order. <laughs> his was not. His right. was pure so this, chaos. This is where the reporter is interviewing Ledger and he's sort of walking with Ledger through the house. Ledger's almost like going about his daily business and, and this is what the yeah, guy says. So what the reporter describes is there's art hung on the wall. Some of it's backwards. Some of it's upside down. There's an open bag with clothes spilling out on the floor in the master bedroom. His kitchen table is awash with objects. There's a chess set. There's assorted books. There's empty glasses. This is just a person's life in disarray. And remember he was you know portraying the Joker. Maybe he brought some of those tendencies yep. into his personal personal life. Uh, the reporter said of Ledger, he was hard pressed to keep still. He got up and poured coffee. He stepped outside into the courtyard and smoked a cigarette. He shook his hair out from under its hood, put a rubber band around it, took the rubber band out, put on a hat, took off the hat, put the hood back up. He went outside, had another cigarette. What you're hearing is a guy who's sort of fidgety, sort of twitchy. Yep. Um, and this is indicative of people who are using drugs sometimes is that there's a sort of nervous energy that needs an expression. And sometimes you'll see these sort of habits of going out, smoking the cigarette and so forth. All this is showing him in the throes of addiction while he's at the height of his fame and doing an interview with the New York yeah, Times and remember, reporter. We know from Jerry Grinnell that he was addicted at this point. He was doing copious amounts of drugs. He, and we know from the investigations that came later that it had gone back for months and he was really, like you said, in the yeah. throes of addiction at this point. And that all brings us back to the fateful day of January 22nd, 2008. Ledger's housekeeper, Teresa Solomon, al arrived late that morning and reported she heard Ledger snoring at 1230, which must have been a welcome sight to her. I mean, you got to figure that she knew about his difficulty sleeping. The fact he's still sleeping well into the afternoon must have been a great sign. Um, then at 2.45, his masseuse, a woman by the name of Diana Wollison, arrives for a 3 p.m. massage. Uh, he does not respond to knocks. Eventually, the two women, growing concerned, work their way into the bedroom, and they find Le Ledger unconscious and naked on the floor with numerous pill bottles scattered, scattered around him. They attempt to revive him, but it's too late. And this is where things really get interesting. And now here's where things get tricky because you have the two women who arrive on the scene, Teresa Solomon and Diana Wallazin. They try to revive him. It's too late. He's naked there on the floor. Approximately 15 minutes after they discover Ledger's body, they made their first phone call. So you can imagine 15 minutes of franticness. You've got an unconscious celebrity on the floor naked. They were what trying to administer help to him, but may or may not have known what they were doing exactly. But in any event, it's ineffective. So at some time later, they make a call. They make a call. You think the first call would be to 911. It is not. The first phone call that's made is to Ledger's longtime friend, Mary Kate Olson, of course, from Full House fame. She's Michelle Tanner, one of the two twins. Um, they reach out to her. She's in L.A. at the time. They don't know that maybe. Uh, and they ask, what should they do? They do reach her. The actress at that point doesn't instruct the women to call 911. Instead, what she says is, call my private security guard in New York, who will meet you at Ledger's apartment, and he'll handle the matter himself. Um, Solomon and Wolzen told the investigators, nevertheless, they end up calling 911. Even though they hear from uh, Olsen, uh, just call my private security to handle this, they apparently freak out. They call 911. The paramedics arrive seven minutes later. And, and guess who also shows in up? In the meantime, Olsen has called her private security guard, and he too shows up at the same time that the uh, that the paramedics show up. Now, this looks like suspicious. It looks like maybe he's there to clean up the affair. We don't know that for a fact, but the fact that... Uh, 
Olsen wanted her to call, wanted them to call the private person rather than nine one one is a strange fact in this case. Yeah, and as we talked about earlier, as part of the investigation into Ledger's death, New York state authorities tried to determine where he had gotten these drugs, specifically the pain medications. The narcotics, oxycodone and hydrocodone. Which he, as you mentioned earlier, did not have a prescription for. So he's got it. They find the sleep meds. They find the anti-anxiety meds. So they find that the, uh, again, that the first two had been prescribed by doctors in Texas and California, multiple doctors. It's most likely that Ledger, that the two doctors didn't know about each other. Ledger wanting more medication than either doctor was willing to give them on their own, sort of shopped around, got multiple doctors to to give them to him. They found that he had not been prescribed the oxycodone and hydrocodone. And for this reason, they turned the case over to the DEA. Now it's a drug investigation as opposed to just a death investigation. And the DEA launches a full-scale investigation into how and why Ledger obtained the prescription painkillers that killed him. I have to think this relates to his fame. There are so many people who die from prescription drug overdoses. Many of them are not prescribed. I can't believe the DEA launches full-scale investigations to do each one of these uh, cases. Right. I have to believe it had to do with his level of fame. The DEA consults his doctors, his family, his circle of friends, none of whom claim to have got any knowledge of his use of painkillers or where he might have gotten them. So where do they turn next? So we've got a genuine mystery here, and the one person they need to talk to is Mary-Kate Olson at that point. Um, they had known about the phone call that was placed and the private security coming over, so they set their sights on Mary-Kate. Uh, Ledger and Olson met back in 2006 at the Chateau Marmont when Ledger was filming a movie. They formed a very close friendship, uh, is how it's described. There were rumors that the two dated for a while. Those were never really substantiated, but they were certainly close enough that these two women who showed up on the date of his death thought to call Mary Kate. Right. Um, they did love to party together. There were sort of, uh, you know, reports at the time of this friendship. After Heath and Michelle Williams split, he and Olsen start to spend a lot of time together. So remember, this is when Mary-Kate and Ashley were kind of young socialites. They were young Hollywood as well, and they partied together, and they they were known for partying. Also known for being sort of the New York branch of Hollywood. I remember the Olsen twins were always out and about New York. Obviously, Heath liked to live there in Brooklyn, so it made sense for them to hang out. Given this, and because of the suspicious nature of the phone calls that were made, the DEA tries to ask Mary-Kate Olsen the obvious questions. Number one, why did the housekeeper and the masseuse call her and not 911 when they found Ledger uh, passed out and unconscious and naked on the floor? Second, when she heard her friend was not breathing, why did Olsen not call 911? Or at least instruct the two women who called her and reported that Ledger was on the floor unconscious to call 911. And third, why did she instead call her private security guard, who didn't have medical training, and instructed him to rush over to Ledger's house instead of calling for paramedics or or police? Olsen refused to answer all of these questions. Now, even after they subpoena her, she asserts, I'm not going to provide you with any information uh, you want unless you first give me immunity from criminal prosecution. Now, we have to pause here because asking for immunity from criminal prosecution doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything to prosecute you about, but it certainly raises a lot of red flags. And just so we're clear, there's no direct evidence linking Mary-Kate Olsen to the drugs Ledger took. All evidence is based on innuendo, speculation, conjecture. But it sure as hell, to the point you were making, seems that if she had not done anything wrong, she would be happy to comply with the DEA's investigation, given that she really does want to find out what happened to her friend. But instead, not only does she refuse to to answer questions, she says, I'll do so, but only under the condition I get immunity. You only need immunity from things you've done wrong. I mean, again, it's it's. Now, look, she's probably advised by lawyers herself who say there's nothing good that can come of you talking to the DA. The only thing that can come is they gather enough evidence to build a case against you. So the safe thing to do here is to not talk to them. There can be an innocent path to giving your client that advice, but it certainly smells. Well, and we should should point out that that providing someone with prescription drugs without a prescription, obviously, Mary-Kate Ellison has no ability to write prescriptions. So if she had given him the prescription drugs, painkillers, and we are speculating here, if she had given him, there's real, and he dies as a result of it, which is what happened here. I remember the investigators' findings that he died because of the pain medications. Yes. 
there is real criminal liability, felony criminal liability, real jail time that could have uh, could have attached to that. Absolutely. We've seen this in more recent contexts with people like Mac Miller. Uh, Mac Miller died from uh, fentanyl laced opioids that were given to him. The people who dealt those drugs to Mac Miller were eventually prosecuted and convicted for crimes in right. relation to the death that resulted. That's different because those are drug dealers than a friend. But still, there's some overlap. Have the there. Tyler Skaggs incident example. The Angels pitcher. He's a pitcher for the for the uh, Los Angeles Angels, and he was getting prescription meds, the same kinds of things that that uh, Heath Ledger was taking from a clubhouse employee, presumably a friend of his. We don't know about the financial transaction he made, but I'm sure Skaggs was paying for the drugs, but clubhouse, not a drug dealer. The clubhouse tenant was just somebody who knew how to get these for him. They prosecuted this guy, and he did real jail time, prison time, as a result of this prosecution. So theoretically, if Mary Kate had provided these drugs to Ledger and they killed him, she could have faced real drug jail time again. But shortly thereafter, it should be pointed out, Olson issued a statement through her attorney that, quote, despite tabloid speculation, she, quote, had nothing whatsoever to do with the drugs found in Heath Ledger's home or his body, and she does not know where he obtained them. It seems like the kind of thing she could have said directly to the DEA without demanding immunity in exchange. Um, but absent Olson's cooperation, the investigation of the ledger's death stalled. And to this day, no one knows for sure how he obtained the drugs that killed him. And, you know, look, this is obviously a very intriguing aspect of Heath Ledger's death. And I know people want concrete answers and you can draw conclusions from uh, the role she played and her unwillingness to speak to the DEA. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. And the person who knew this best was actually Heath Ledger's father, Kim, who, in addressing these accusations and the innuendo out there that others may have been responsible for his son's death, really, to his credit, refused to place any blame. He told the Daily Mirror, quote, it was totally his fault. It was no one else's. He reached for them. He put them in his system. You can't blame anyone else in that situation. That's hard to accept because I loved him so much and was so proud of him. And really, there's something to that. I, he He's. You know, Kim Kim Ledger has been a guy who's been in the media a little bit. He's sort of an old school guy. He's like, this is a matter of personal responsibility. I'm very sad that my son passed, but I'm not looking to to blame others for his demise. He was a man in the throes of addiction, and he ultimately succumbed to it. Obviously, what he's saying has a lot of merit to it. It still doesn't absolve the person who gave it to him. It doesn't. Of, of guilt, of criminal liability. It just doesn't absolve that person who might have given somebody. Heath Ledger was taking a ton of prescription meds. If the person knew that he was taking these ton of prescription meds, which is quite possible, and layers on top of that, pain medications without saying to him, why don't you go see your doctor instead? Yeah. Like, there's some culpability there. There really is. Uh, ultimately, it ri lies with Heath. He is first and foremost to blame for his own death. But you're right, because drug addiction, especially of, of Heath's variety, remember, the New York Times reporter was there. This wasn't a man who wasn't showing any ill effects right. of being in the throes of addiction. He was fidgety. He was oh, having trouble sleeping. Oh, his good friend sleeping. Jerry Grinnell knew he was taking huge quantities of Ambien and anti-anxiety meds. That's right. And Jerry Grinnell didn't, uh, as far as we know, no. furnish him with any drugs right. or anything they, of that nature. That was investigated and that was ruled out. So, yes. So, what about the counterfactual yep. here, Derek? We like to do this. If Heath Ledger doesn't die on that fateful day... What's his career look like? I mean, he was right there with some of the biggest leading men of Hollywood of his generation. I mean, we're talking about his contemporaries were Ryan Gosling, Bradley Cooper, Leonardo DiCaprio, Christian Bale, and Joaquin Phoenix. Now, who do I see him most analogous to? It's probably Leonardo DiCaprio, to yeah. be honest with you. The guy who could do it all. He actually did more sort of comedic work, I think, than Leonardo DiCaprio. Had, a, had you know, 10 Things I Hate About You is a, a legendary. But that was early on. He was, yes. he was looking for work at that point. By the time that he became becomes an established star, he's accepting fewer and fewer roles in more and more important movies. That's right. Not all of them hit, clearly. Leo's got disasters also. Yes. But some of them were big, and he was looking to take that more artistic role, more look, I mean, to, to direct. He was yes. really an artist. That's yeah. why I see real shades of Joaquin Phoenix. And uh -huh. I'll tell you why. Because the last movie he was in is pretty forgettable. You mentioned it at the top of the show, The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. That's a Terry Gilliam movie. He's yeah. from Monty Python. He does really out there, weirdo art house type movies. Yeah. Joaquin Phoenix is is known to do some of those type of roles. I obviously think of them together because now Joaquin Phoenix is the Joker. Yeah. Uh, in the, they in the, both won Academy Awards playing the same both, character. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's a great trivia question, yeah. by the way. <laughs> um, I see elements of Joaquin, and this is no no um, offense or shade on Joaquin Phoenix, though. There's just an element of heartthrob that, that Heath Ledger and Leonardo DiCaprio have that yeah. Joaquin Phoenix really isn't going for. He's much more sort of the eccentric. And who knows how his career plays out, but there was... To, to your point, he was considered a great actor, very handsome, 
I think the we could have done whatever he wanted, frankly. I think that's right. He could have been he a Marvel to... superhero at some point. It, you know, it just it, that's the kind of path that he was he was on. He had lots of famous friends, Heath Ledger did, many of whom spoke warmly and openly about what a fantastic friend and father he was. His ex and Matilda's mother, uh, Michelle Williams, said, quote, my heart is broken. I'm the mother of the most tender-hearted, high-spirited, beautiful little girl, and she is the spitting image of her father. The most consistent thing you hear from just about everyone was what a zest for life that he had, his passion for his art and his daughter, and for living life to the fullest. So we'll give the last word to musician Ben Harper, one of Ledger's best friends, talking to a documentary about the fallen star. Heath was the most alive human. If, and if it wasn't on the edge, it didn't interest him. If there wasn't a risk, some type of risk involved, he had no time for it. He went all the way out in the time that he had. He went all the way to the edge. Some people are just bigger than the world has room for. Him.